Steve, this is the next in our series of sessions, insider sessions, where we take an inside peek into the kind of work that's going on in some of the leading research centers, doctoral research centers, masters of the research centers in the world, um, in order to give you a kind of fly on the wall um, insight to the kind of activities, the kind of research that's going on. And this is uh, following on from a, a series of very successful sessions that we've already had with ICD Stuttgart, ETH Zurich, uh, Tongji University, FIU, uh, UCL Bartlett, and so on. Um, uh, today, then, we we, uh, we 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 look at probably the, probably the most famous institution in the world in terms of universities, um, certainly very foremost, the foremost of in terms of architectural design, or maybe so you say graduate school of design, of design itself, um, at Harvard GSD. It's a place in many ways that doesn't need much, much of an introduction. Uh, it has had encountered among its professors some of the most illustrious figures in the world of architecture. We can think of Rem Kohlhaas, Jack, Jack Herzog and so on going back, uh, Fashid Masavi and so on. It has a, an astonishing lineup um, of faculty. Um, I personally have a very special relationship to, to the GSD. I taught there, it must be about 10 years ago now. Um, and I also was a student at the University of Cambridge, uh, Emmanuel College University of Cambridge, which was the same college where John Harvard studied back in 1884, 1484. Queen Elizabeth I planted a ceremonial oak tree when they founded the college, and she made this comment that I am planting an oak tree and who knows what fruit it will bear. Well, a few years later, John Harvard graduated and then he went to the States and of course, the rest is history. It's an astonishing success story in many ways. I'm, I'm going to be um, uh, handing over, so I have in some sense have a relationship, I'm a fellow graduate of Emmanuel College to, 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 uh, to John Harvard himself, someone you'll see in, in, in the Harvard Yard courtyard, uh, his statue there. Um, so I'm going to be handing on to Jose Luis. Martin Beckhold is also here today. Um, and I'll be joining you back at the, to after the presentations um, and uh, for questions afterwards. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. If you're following on YouTube, please put them in the chat there. So um, I'm going to um, uh, stop sharing my screen and, um, uh, and uh, pass on to Jose Luis. Welcome, Jose. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, it is a pleasure to be here and an honor. We are big fans of the work of the Digital Futures team, and we were really honored to be invited to share some of the work that we've been doing in the past few years here at the Design School at Harvard. I would like to welcome my colleagues. Um, many of us are either doctor um, doctors or are in the process of being there. We are also, uh, many of us are part of the material processes and systems group here at Research Lab at the GSD. And um, I would like to invite my colleague, Martin Betchhold, who will be the one who perhaps will give a more formal introduction of the work that we do in the team. And then uh, we will follow that up with a series of presentations by team members, doctoral students, research scientists from the group to kind of give an, of an overview of the kind of work that we're interested in and the kind of knowledge that we're hoping to contribute to the world. Martin, if you will. All right, sounds good. Uh, so yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, uh, whatever the case may be. Happy to be here. Neil, thanks so much for having us. Um, I, I'm gonna start with just giving a very, very brief overview of doctoral work at the GSD. Um, and just to start with, uh, our graduates essentially are global, all these small dots, the red dots, if you can see them, that's where we have alumni of one of our doctoral programs working. Actually, this, this member is a slightly older one. We now have folks in Africa. Just want to give you a sense of the difference between the two doctoral programs. So, so we have a PhD program, traditional program, um, where you start with a bachelor, you can go up to the PhD, you reach the tip of the pyramid, right? when you come in with a master you come in a little bit higher up and then you can get a doctor of design which is a slightly more applied version of doctoral work uh, of course uh, it's clear that the, the kind of research continues so instead of this being a pyramid lead is more like an hourglass of knowledge so today the doctoral work we're going to see is actually happening in the doctor design program from the GC and that is the kind of intellectual continental plates of the DDES program at the GSD. I know this doesn't mean much to you, but uh, here is a basic the distribution of doctoral work uh, according to our three departments, uh, the kind of terracotta, share, color, architecture, green landscape, blue and urban. And everything in gray is broadly speaking in technology, which is what we're going to show today. So a lot of the work in architecture is essentially 
around digital things, material things, which is what we're going to talk about a bit today. So let me let me continue now with a kind of brief introduction of the group itself, um, the material process and systems group. You're seeing a bunch of people today. Not everybody's here. So we're, we're about um, 15 or so up and down. Uh, and um, and essentially, uh, right now, there's a kind of main focus uh, from my angle on kind of two things. One is the kind of uh, new material solutions for buildings and products. And the second set is to kind of understand what actually are the effects of our designs on people, uh, an area which we know surprisingly little about. Uh, part of this work is really collaborations with a, a number of groups which are not traditionally associated with design research. These are essentially scientists. You can see their expertise. Um, they're both local here at Harvard, uh, across the nation or across the Atlantic. Uh, and, and these collaborations really kind of help us advance work on the edge of what design has usually been defined at. Uh, and common to all this work is that we're looking at things at vastly different scales, from really the nano scale to the kind of larger regional scale. Um, and we sort of entered in the three sort of uh, areas of computation, which uh, obviously Jose Lewis is very much representing, as well as others on the call, advanced fabrication methods broadly, and then the collaboration with scientists, uh, both on the material side and on the psychology side. So um, part of that has been a number of projects in the 3D printing space, uh, some of which we'll see today. Um, but um, the overarching idea around the materials uh, aspects, uh, the kind of new materials part of our work is really to do more with fewer materials. And this has to do with the idea of circularity. If we reduce the mix of materials that we need to put buildings together, it'll make the kind of end of life scenario for buildings. The other question, what we do with buildings when they reach the end of useful server life, it'll make that much easier to either recycle, reuse, or, or simply kind of uh, bring it back in some other way into the production stream. So sort of empowering materials through computation, through advanced computation, and through collaboration with scientists. So um, I want to start with uh, one product very briefly uh, that really starts with a problem. Um, it, it goes into post-tensioning of ceramics. Obviously, post-tensioning itself is quite widely known, and there's, there's very few precedents in ceramics itself. We decided to use with to use discarded extrusion profiles and, and actually use those structurally. So use stuff that is normally discarded, they use it structurally, they actually make long, long sort of uh, long-term structural systems. Um, ceramics can last for 100 years, right? So there's a kind of huge life cycle aspect about that. So we started off with doing a lot of testing uh, in our own labs here, just to determining how can we actually join different profiles? How can we post sensing them and, and how, do we evaluate those mechanical properties and taking that knowledge in an initial design study, which was geared towards an exhibition at a trade fair show in Spain, um, sort of breeding a kind of structural uh, that would basically serve as a demonstrator that actually indeed they can produce structural forms with standard industrial ceramic extrusions. Um, among other things, we developed a node uh, that was primarily generated and then 3D printed, uh, the node would basically accommodate the different angular configuration in this arch-like system, uh, accommodate the post-tension member. So you'd see these different sort of tubes running through this node here at different angles, but all that was automatic, automatically generated. Uh, the idea was the node would be filled with concrete to have enough compressive strength, uh, but the form was 3D printed. Uh, and we then produce a kind of uh, element of this system for one of the trade fair shows to kind of demonstrate the feasibility of the basic approach. Um, the next year, uh, we then developed a simpler design that still demonstrates that ceramic can produce beams that work in bending, doing all the things that we have to do with structural design, um, using the kind of knowledge we generated through the mechanical testing, um, and then basically detailing this system to actually become a functional structure, a lot of attention to the joints, which are the most delicate area. 
Um, and um, with exhibitions, uh, you got to be there on day one. So we tend to always test the assembly somewhere else before we go into the trade fair show and set things up. So this was all prefabricated, produced by our partners in Spain, um, using a variety of the standard, it's discarded extrusions. Um, and that was then the, the, the setup uh, demonstrating that actually ceramics can be used for non-decorative uses for structural uses through post tensioning and that allows us to bring back a kind of circularity to that sector. So this is a, a study of static equilibrium, if you wish. Uh, my second uh, project very briefly is dealing with a very, very different scale. And here we got into this really without uh, trying to solve a problem. It's a more speculative uh, exploration. Um, where we looked at uh, the idea of ferrofluidics being a, essentially a liquid that can produce that, that we can get to produce shapes based on magnetic interaction. We can cast materials on top of that fluid. Uh, if these fluids that we're casting do not mix with the ferrofluidic, we can actually generate shapes. So this is a highly dynamic situation. The field is radial. It changes in magnitude all the time. And this is something we cannot actually computationally simulate, not even with the most advanced nonlinear simulation methods. So essentially going to have to ask the material to develop these expressions. And the, the shapes we're getting are quite unique. This is not uh, these are not shapes we would be easily be able to generate with any other methods. And we've been talking about features here at the millimeter scale. So we then built an adjustable mold of, of uh, 25 magnets that can be going up and down. And depending on their relative position, they will produce in different spiking features on the ferrofluidic uh, medium at the top, which then generates different kinds of patterns. We built an interface, electronics. So we kind of built a tooling kit. Uh, here you can see a diagram of these uh, high adjusted magnets. And we then get different kind of shapes. So we ask the question, well, can we use these tiles to produce something that we can actually recognize? So on the right hand side, you're seeing the different shapes that we generate through the adjustable mold. And on the left hand side, if you kind of squint, uh, you can see maybe an image that you might recognize. Okay. So we sort of demonstrated that with this uh, system, we can have a waste free method to developing customized expressions to produce images. Again, a project where we set out to not solve a problem, just to explore how we can empower materials with the new ideas around the interactions of materials. But well, that is my part. And with that, I'm going to turn this to, I believe, Olga. Good morning, I'm Olga Mesa, and I will be presenting a research entitled Woven Compliant Composites. This research is meant to contribute to the design of kinetic architectural skin. This research uses composites to design kinetic compliant mechanisms that behave as hybrids between a fabric and a surface, undergoing shear buckling, reversible three-dimensional configurations are achieved by using the width bias of fabric. The literature review showed opportunities to expand existing work on compliant surface systems, which established the following research goals for this work. Shape change and actuation methods are to be decoupled to allow for any combination of environmentally driven and user-determined transformation. Designs should allow multiple elements to be actuated with few and simple actuators. We wanted to achieve complex doubly curved forms in order to produce stiff three-dimensional shapes. And fabrication methods were to be simple with emphasis on producing flat composite forms that minimize mold costs. This is the fabric in its flat stage on the left and its actuated stage on the right, 
after it has been pulled. Woven fabrics are anisotropic materials with different elastic constants based on the direction of the applied tensile force. Poisson ratio and Young's modulus for a fabric are highest when the direction of tensile force is at 45 degrees relative to the weave direction. Our design utilizes these principles. The system utilizes a combination of high Poisson ratio and the small but significant in-plane surface stiffness of composite fabrics. The fabrication method allows flat composites to transform into doubly curved kinetic elements without the need for molds. Following the geometrical analysis of woven composite fabrics, a series of samples were produced to fabricate durable composites that allowed controllable and repeatable transformations from flat to doubly curved surfaces. In the context of our research, the intended behavior is defined as the deformation necessary where two opposite corners perpendicular to the axis of actuation touch. The relation between fabric type, weave, matrix, laminations, and localized reinforcement was studied to achieve repeatable, durable, and functional components that displayed instant transformations through the production of several samples. Each sample was tested to determine behavior type, sample durability, actuation force, displacement of corner points, and transition stages. The intended behavior was achieved by either using a stiffer woven fabric or by adding central fiber reinforcement perpendicular to the axis of actuation. Since our fabrics consist of perpendicularly oriented fibers immersed in a soft matrix, two computational models, Neofukian and Holzafeld, were tested in the FEA simulations. Although Neofukian models are used to predict nonlinear behaviors, uh, nonlinear strain behaviors, the Holzafeld model approximated the behavior of the physical samples better as it takes into account the anisotropic behaviors of fibers. Given the close agreement of physical tests, the Holzapfeld model was used to simulate the compliant composite mechanisms. Architectural applications were proposed using compliant composites as kinetic surfaces for facades and interior partitions. In these applications, tessellations were generated by patterning a single monolithic composite fabric to achieve varying degrees of porosity and change in three-dimensional shape. These created adjustable surfaces actuated uniaxially and biaxially, producing different degrees of porosity. These were reversible and efficiently actuated by reducing the number of actuators per module. In conclusion, kinetic response is generated without the use of complicated mechanisms by relying on material properties and smart geometries. Our system expands work on kinetic surfaces with the advantage of ease of actuation and fabrication. This moldless technique proposes an alternative for the composite industry and expands research on adjustable skins, such as differential swelling of thin wood elements and buckling of composites by proposing a simple actuation method based on the mechanics of fabrics. These surfaces can be used in architectural applications, such as facades, shading mechanisms, and interior partitions where performative qualities are desirable. Thank you. Now I believe. Uh, yep, Olga, I'm going to go. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Olga.
Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Katrina Richter-Lan, and I'm a DDES candidate at the GSD. I've been involved with the MAPS group for about four years, um, so since my master's and now into my doctoral work. Today, I'll be speaking briefly about my work I do around what I like to call sentient spy design, which essentially represents for me the translation of covert physiological signals into environmental factors to be more emotionally reactive and in turn provide an alternative mode of therapeutic intervention to increase well-being. So what does that really mean? Uh, well, it means that I seek to track a variety of subconscious and quantitative metrics, such as heart rate, electrodermal activity, EEG, brain frequencies, respiration rate, and more to further understand a person's immediate response in an environment and translate those signals in real time to either a wearable device, piece of furniture, robotic arm, or spatial quality, such as materiality, to react accordingly to to that interpreted data. This work, as you can imagine, is positioned at the intersection of a multitude of fields and methodologies, namely psychophysiology and cognitive psychology, sensory environments and design, and effective computing and human machine interaction. And it is within this overlap where I situate my work, both previous and forthcoming, and the methodology followed for my design intervention. Methodologically, this usually looks like this. Uh, starting with the human, a collection of their raw physiological signals are collected. This data is then analyzed and assessed to be linked with a certain cognitive state. This interpretation then actuates a specific desired sensorial output which in return influences the human through their experience of that stimulus. So examples of this translation might look like this. Um, this was a project I worked on for Jose Luis's Intro to Computational Design class, in which a person's EEG waves were recorded while they were listening to music, and in turn influenced different aspects of the music as their EEG frequencies changed in real time, meaning that qualities of the music, such as volume and pace, which change, would change depending on the most dominant EEG frequency of the listener. This project suggested um, a use for catered alterations in our music to occur in real time, for example, while studying or working out. Or DOZE, which is a collaborative project in which we looked at addressing the growing prevalence of poor sleep and embraced the material qualities of hydrogels, the sleep mask can be tuned to your sleep rhythms based on personal physiological metrics, which activates an embedded heater to release a specific scent personalized to the person's need throughout the night. Or even a wearable device that looked at mediating cravings associated with smoking addiction through slight transcutaneous electrical acupoint stimulation. Again, this took a combination of sensor data to detect physical symptoms of craving and in turn activate the light electrical pulse at specific acupoints around the wrist, which had been shown to reduce the intensity of cravings. And this brings me to my master's thesis work at the GSD, in which I developed a series of what I call effective prosthetics, which are a series of furniture attachments or wearable devices that investigate a different combination of sensorial experiences, which respond to specific physiological signals. In order to suggest a poss possible methodology that explores our sensory perception, I first looked at each sense in isolation and the range of cognitive impact each of these senses hold on mood and emotion, and what might be the best form factor as well as sensory intervention to use for a specific outcome. Starting with the wrist piece, this wearable explores the use of both haptic and auditory feedback while sitting intimately on the wrist. This piece looks specifically at interpreting patterns of electrodermal activity, so sweat sensors, and heart rate variability to recognize signs of stress and anxiety to in turn pneumatically actuate silicon pockets facing the interior of the wrist. 
These air pockets seek to mimic slow inhales and exhales, both auditorily and haptically, to soothe and bring embodied awareness to one's cognitive state. The second piece looks at haptic guidance, however, this time with no auditory stimulus and in the form of soft vibra vibrations rather than pressure. The haptic chair attachment detects heightened and low levels of electrodome activity, signaling an individual's level of emotional arousal in conjunction with motion gathered from an accelerometer. In response, a series of 20 vibration motors lining the fins of the piece actuate when single signals suggest either a state of restlessness and agitation or drowsiness and decreased focus. The desk attachment looks solely at olfaction and the power of scent diffusion for focus or relaxation. Similarly to the chair, this piece, lo this piece looks to measure the edge conditions of emotional arousal, which in this context would suggest either decreased attention and sleepiness or an increase in stress. Devised of the multitude of layers, the piece consists of a 3D printed rib structure which wraps around the desk. Underneath the structure lies 100% cotton embroidered with 40 gauge nichrome wire with two discrete paths to represent two separate heating systems. The paths directly correlate to the openings in the 3D structure, which act as chambers to house the specific scent to be activated. Depending on the physiological signals received, a certain heating path will be deployed, resulting in the activation of one of the two scents. So in this case, either lavender or peppermint. And finally, the light attachment focuses its capability on tempering the quality of the light which the bulb emits to in turn um, change the admission and brightness based on the needs of the individual. With a number of precedent work illustrating the effect of light brightness on one's mood and alertness, this peak seeks very simply to mimic a dimmer by leveraging programmable material properties and heating actuation. Embedded with 28 gauge nichrome wire and a bilayer material of PET and aluminum, the piece houses any typical LED light bulb. Due, the, due, due to the difference in expansion rates between the PET and aluminum, when heated, a certain, certain curling occurs, resulting in greater permeability of light. All of this to essentially lead me back to the importance of understanding not only the qualitative data on which the discipline of design often relies on, but supplement such information with real-time objective quant quantitative data, whilst always putting human well-being at the center of our design decisions. And I guess before I pass it on to my colleague Marula, I would like to leave you with a teaser of the work to come out of my doctoral dissertation, which is looking greatly at my previous work around translating these physiological cues in real time to sensorial interventions. However, this time at the scale of the built environment through the lens of materiality, scale, pattern, and geometry. Thank you for listening. And I'll pass it now on to Marula, who's very much within the same realm. Thank you. Thank you, Katarina, for the great presentation. Um, I will. Um, I'm sorry. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Marula Zacharias. I am an architect by training and currently a doctoral candidate here at the GSD. The topic of my doctoral uh, research is situated at the intersection of design, material systems, and photobiology. And today I'm going to present a series of projects that lie in that intersection, with the main project being my work in progress for my doctoral thesis, for which I'm advised by Professor Martin Bechtold, Professor Antoine Picon, and Professor Stephen Lockley from the Harvard Medical School. I wanted to start with the definition of the term of photobiology. And then continue with what it means within the context of the built environment and how I use it in my research. 
The definition of photobiology is the study of the effects of light on living organisms. And these organisms, as we see here, can range from single cell organisms to plants to humans. Uh, here we see some examples, the most known of them being photosynthesis, which is the process that allows plants to grow, but also uh, phototropism, the process through which the plants shape their form based on their angular and three-dimensional special connection um, to light. Another example where we see uh, photobiology and changing the appearance of the built environment is the exciting phenomenon of bioluminescence, which has recently been filled with many applications and design and really promising. Uh, to scale the topic to humans, a field of study with a significant impact on us humans and our health is the clocking, the regulation of our circadian rhythm and its relationship to light. What makes photobiology so exciting for me and so promising for many other researchers and scientists is the fact that it, it not only examines light in relationship to life, but also how time plays into that relationship. And this is what I am also dealing with in my research. So once you can see these images and think, how do we translate the knowledge deriving from this area into the build environment? And uh, here um, I'm showing through three images of projects I of projects I did that deal with that problem from totally different angles. Uh, for example, on the left, we see a lighting sculpture that is made out of lenses that amplify the light coming from a very deemed low power uh, light source so that it can help plants grow. So uh, keeping the, the, the power levels low, we can power up that lamp through its uh, materiality. Whereas, uh, because everything is custom made and CNC cut, the, the lenses are designed so that they uh, concentrate the light on the side of the plant, whereas the other side, the rest of the lenses can be uh, providing a more dim light. Uh, in the middle, we see an experimental project working with color changing biocomposites and in particular color changing mycelium. As we know, uh, mycelium is a material that grows under specific temperature and lighting conditions. And through this project, I wanted to examine its potential to have a different photochemical behavior in the built environment through the integration of color uh, changing pigments. In the third image, we see how uh, we see where I'm currently driving my research towards. Um, and this is this is not an image of my work, but I wish my doctoral work to look as good as I'm uh, working currently working on it. Um, so, and it's about color. In particular, it's, it's about spectrum. Uh, as we will see, color in this spectrum photobiology world is a perceptual feature. So, to understand the effect of color uh, in to the build environment, sorry, my screen has frozen. We have to really under, forget about color for a second and think about spectrum. For example, here we see uh, on the right, we see an image that changes color, but what really changes uh, is the spectrum of the light that goes through its nanostructure. And this is what it makes it behave differently based on the different levels of curvature and texture that we see on that picture. Um, so how does that affect our circadian rhythm? The spectral content of light that heats our retina activates a receptor uh, that controls the production of melatonin, the hormone that is responsible for the regulation of our circadian rhythm. When we get exposed to blue light, melatonin secretion is suppressed, so we feel more alert. When we uh, get exposed to red light, and more correctly said, since we talked about forgetting color for a second, light of higher wavelength, we feel less alert. The science was discovered here at Harvard in the 80s, and the surprising fact that is all this phenomenon is non-visual. It even affects people with visual impairments or single-cell organisms that don't have eyes. Um, 
This is an image that I find really fascinating and it's from uh, Architectural Design Journal and it's special issue on neuro architecture. I highly recommend that issue for anyone interested in the topic. It shows the cells that are responsible for this phenomenon and for the secretion of melatonin in our body. And it's interesting here we see that we see that these cells occupy a very small percentage of our retina. Uh, it's a 0.05% and they still have that much of an impact to our health and our well-being. How have designers so far uh, attempted to address that effect of light through artificial light? Uh, more specifically, light of different wavelengths, which again, we like to um, correspond to the notion of color. So uh, for a nighttime setting, we would prefer, uh, designers would usually do is place warmer, um, but warmer light sources, whereas for a daylight, for a like a working setting, um, more daylight, cool light, uh, light sources are recommended. Now, why this does not work well? Uh, because we can also see it in this picture. It's not only about the light, it's about the light in the built environment. So it's really about how this light hits the walls and how this illumination comes and hits our retina. So it's a really invisible but impactful phenomenon. For example, here we showed how uh, this this curve, which is the melanopic light, is the light that promotes alertness. Alertness. Uh, when the melanopic levels in the content of light are high, this M over P ratio raises above one and that promotes alertness. So we have to remember kind of above one promotes alertness, M over P below one promotes sleepiness. And what we see here, uh, this is an example of a study I completed on a white wall uh, with uh, different um, colors, um, light sources of different temperatures, we see that in a white wall, a warm and cool light kind of bring us in the middle. We said below one, but this is 0 0.5. It could be way less uh, or 0 0.9. It doesn't even reach the above one benchmark for alertness that we need. So once I started working on this, um, on these experiments, I thought, how can we uh, enhance that impact of color temperature in combination with something else? And here we have a white wall, but I was thinking, what if something else was would be um, a color that would change, a surface that would change color? It would amplify this phenomenon. For example, here we see, whereas before we had a 0 0.9 value, here we have a almost double, 1.75. What if we had a wall that could change colors and turns blue in the morning and red in the evening or blue uh, behave differently under a blue light and differently uh, under a warmer light? Uh, so these are snapshots of some additional experiments I did, both in a simulation environment uh, and a physical environment. For my simulations, I'm using Alpha. It's a great software that is working uh, on that science. So they have a very advanced algorithm to calculate this M over P values. But again, it's uh, more about the light. And what I wish to do through my research is to bring this into the world of materials. So this is the a scheme of the ideal behavior of a material that would selectively redirect illumination and selectively change uh, the spectrum of the reflected illumination inside an interior space. This very phenomenon has not been studied extensively. So there are a lot of unknowns that I'm strategically and slowly integrating into my experimental process. Uh, so far, I have done experiments with flat walls, but now as I progress, I'm moving more towards textures and different properties that can affect that phenomenon. Uh, so it's really a process where I'm uh, going back to the literature for any different property that is added into that equation of this circadian behavior performance. Uh, for example, we know that optics affect this phenomenon. We know how 
metals work, we know how plastics work, but we don't know how the same material with a different texture would behave differently. And this is uh, the very topic of my research. Uh, these are some examples of the properties I'm integrating into that system. And um, I would love to share more as this process progresses. Uh, whoever wants to talk about lighting and design, uh, please reach out. I love talking about it. And uh, thank you so much. All right. Hello, everyone. All right, great. Uh, my name is Daniel Tisch, and I'm a doctor design candidate here at the uh, Graduate School of Design and at the uh, MAPS Group. I'll be showing a project of mine today entitled Material Learning. Um, sorry, I'm going to flip back one second. Uh, this project appropriates image based neural network techniques to interrogate the full extent of the formal design space made possible through multi material 4D printing. So the project is the intersection between uh, materiality and computation. Uh, Bilayer is a broad category of smart materials that are created by adhering two materials with different coefficients of expansion together. Uh, here you see a bilayer material created from the layering of PET and polyethylene responding to a, a heat lamp. The difference in coefficient of expansion means that as one half of the composite expand at a faster rate than its counterpart, the entire structure curls or twists to help to resolve these internal stresses. We can see uh, this behavior with a range of different uh, from temperature, as we saw in the previous video, to humidity changes has been well explored uh, by the ACD, or through submersion and swelling, which will be the test case that's used here. This project leverages multi-material additive manufacturing print, not only swellable and non-swellable materials that are required to make these bilayers, but also produce a gradient of swellability that creates these variations in curvature that you see in the middle picture by digitally mixing the two materials. So with this possibility afforded by the gradients of active material, the, form, the goal was to find new formal possibilities <clears throat> within the space of bilayer material. So this project is multifaceted. <clears throat> it begins by simulating many different material distributions of swellable behaviors to search for novel forms and behavior. Uh, in the extensive literature relating to bilayer materials, we common see, commonly see behaviors such as curling, twisting, and folding. So the question was whether we could find any new behaviors and uh, could we find that through this expansive design space exploration. So in the second portion of the project, uh, then leverages machine learning uh, to predict the form of any given material distribution. And finally, uh, an inverse modeling paradigm is planned, uh, which would be capable of creating the appropriate material distribution from a desired form. So for the design space exploration, I wanted to create many different material distribution patterns. And to do so, I used a computational pattern producing network or a CPPN. So this is an extremely simple neural net, which can be controlled by just a few variables to produce the images like you see on the right, and which are really just an image representation of the function that's happening inside the network. Uh, in these patterns, black and white represent fully swellable materials on the, black, on the back and front side of the composite respectively, while uh, shades of gray represent less swellable materials and 50% gray represents no swellability whatsoever. And on the top, you can see sort of, you know, not an exhaustive range, but the types of different patterns that are capable of being produced through the system. So the first step was to simulate the deformations that these surfaces undergo through their state change. The three-dimensional result uh, of the simulation, which was performed using uh, particle spring physics, was encoded into an image by translating the XYZ displacements into the RGB color channels of an image. This is done uh, both because images are a convenient data type to pass around uh, and be because we're anticipating the use of ML algorithms later in the work. So in all, I simulated 6,000 different distributions uh, at a simulation rate of about one to two minutes um, each. So it took quite a bit of time. 
So this is a representation of that data set. Uh, so now sorting through 6,000 squiggly squares in a systematic way is a non-insignificant challenge. Uh, so to help sort through the results, I used the T-SNE algorithm to reduce the dimensionality of the samples from uh, the full depth of the image, which was uh, 1,024, since it's a 32 by 32 image, to just the two axes that you see uh, on this chart. So during this dimensionality reduction, similar shapes get grouped together by likeness. We can then use the k-means algorithm to determine how to cluster the results together. Looking a bit at these clusters, you can see that our dimensionality reduction is grouping shapes um, like shapes from the RGB displacement maps alone. Each cluster displays a unique character, and the samples at the cluster center are the most representative example, or the average, uh, while those that are one standard deviation away from the center offer alternatives to the style. So, and finally, here we can see one of the actual 4D transformations uh, taking place. It's quite mesmerizing, so we'll let it run one more time. Great. So in this example, we, we see a new kind of behavior. There's a dimpled form that you see on the right side of the sample, and that adds a new expression to the palette of bilayer materials. Other examples found in the data set include puckering, pinching, bulging, as well as complex uh, S and C-shaped folds. So moving on to the second phase, uh, machine learning techniques are used to develop a surrogate simulation system, or a way to bypass the computational simulations to allow the designer to quickly understand how a given composite will deform when activated. The goal is to run the simulations fast enough that the designer remains within the flow uh, instead of waiting one to two minutes for simulations like I had to. So a, a pix to pix machine is yeah. trained using TensorFlow to learn the relationship between the input image of the material distribution and the output image of the RGB displacement map. <clears throat> the trained model is then hosted on runway and is able to be queried from Grasshopper using an HTTP server, which we will see here. So here's the, the workflow as the user experiences it. Uh, new CPPN images can be generated on the fly from Grasshopper by adjusting the latent factors that are used to control the image. Uh, that CPPN then gets fed to the trained machine learning model, which returns the RGB dis displacement map, which can then be decoded and uh, displayed in 3D uh, quickly using Grasshopper. So this whole process typically runs in about a second, which is a remarkable improvement over the uh, one to two minutes that we saw in the particle spring simulators. So the accuracy of the ML system, um, it's obviously it's not a perfect match, but it gives enough information about the global features and characteristics to be useful in the design process. So in conclusion, the goal of this project was really uh, to explore how image-based machine learning tools did not have to be contained to the world of, of virtual design. By using multi-material 3D printing, this project actualizes the machine learning result and explores real-world behaviors in the realm of matter and material. And finally, I'd like to thank uh, James Weaver for his help with the multi-material 3D printing and Sarah Norman from our group for sharing the swelling data that enabled the simulation. And with that, I will pass it off to uh, Sara. Thank you, Dan. Uh, just share my screen. Hello, everyone. Uh, hi, this is Saurabh. Um, I'm currently a senior research associate at the Harvard School of Design. Uh, I'm going to present um, some of our work on multi-material ceramic 3D printing. Going back to the point made by Martin about material doing more with less. As compared to polymers, ceramic and concrete are materials that are better suited for large-scale 3D printing applications. But we believe that ceramic holds a lot of promise as a sustainable option and when paired with emerging technologies can drastically reduce the carbon footprint caused by the construction industry. For the last few years, we, the MAPS group, have focused on studying conventional ceramic manufacturing and forming processes 
and researching on how integration of emerging technologies can add novelty to the industry as well as achieve higher goals like customization and sustainability. In the interest of time, I'm going to present one project, Janus. This project demonstrates the novel technique of co-extrusion of two bodies of clay together through a single nozzle, allowing for complex customized ceramic structures that improve efficiency and offer innovative possibilities. After having developed a workflow for the efficient printing of clay, we wanted to see what opportunities arise when we are able to print multiple bodies of clay in one single form. Can we envision walls made of a single ceramic material that vary in performance across their sections, including load bearing, insulation, and lightweight areas within a homogeneous form? That's what we explored in Project Janus. Janus is the god of transition and duality in ancient Rome and hence seemed like an apt name for this project. In a process, we often draw inspiration from various fields to inform our approach. For example, we have observed that extrusion techniques have been successfully applied in the food industry for the production of popular food items for years. This insight has informed our own approach to extrusion-based manufacturing. The same is also well developed in the polymer extrusion industry as well as academia, especially the design of hierarchical coaxial nozzles. We thought that achieving a multi-material 3D printed ceramic workflow could open up new design opportunities for creating complex and customized ceramic objects. So building on our previous work, our setup consisted of two tubes of different bodies of clay oriented at 45 degrees with each other flowing material in one single nozzle. Ceramic undergoes shrinkage in multiple phases from its initial stage of printing to its final stage of firing. Therefore, it was crucial to select two bodies which were quite compatible with similar shrinkage rates and water absorption to ensure successful printing and firing of the final product. The nozzle design was critical to our process and after several iterations, we narrowed down to two designs. One, the Janus nozzle, which could print two materials side by side, and the center co-nozzle, which could print one material inside another. Although both designs had potential design affordances, we chose to focus on the Janus nozzle for this project as it offered more design space to be explored, given the degrees of freedom of the robot it was mounted on. This is how the extrudate material that comes out looks like for both these cases for the Janus as well as the center core nozzle. We conducted multiple tests using the Janus nozzle to explore the design space and establish relationships between various extrusion parameters like robot speed, layer height, bead width, extrusion rate, etc. These tests encompassed a range of dimensions from lines to surfaces to solids. After familiarizing ourselves with the parameters, we conducted tests on flat toolpath objects. Though these tests were examined, through this test, we examined the relationship between the parameters. For example, we found that increasing robot speed while keeping other parameters constant reduced the width of the bead, while decreasing the robot speed increased it. With, hence, by making slight adjustments to the speed, we were able to control the porosity of the tile, as you can see on the image on the right. Here are some images of the fired versions of the 2D tiles that we ended up printing. We experimented with 3D objects where the toolpath was static and the nozzle orientation was dynamic and vice versa. And these are the fired objects for the same. Our computational workflow utilizing a plugin called Makina designed by Jose successfully translated digital geometry into robot code, which in turn gave us a precise control over the printed geometry. By rotating the fourth axis, we accurately determined where a material was deposited. This allowed us to understand the effect of the extruder angle on the printed path and its appearance from both top and side views. Knowing this, we decided to create a proof of concept of the research. To be able to take in input a black and white image and the script would divide the image into horizontal toolpaths 
rotate the nozzle of the extruder 180 degrees at the fringe of the black and the white pixels. Here is a video of the process. And here are the fired versions of the printed tiles. We developed an efficient workflow for printing clay and explored the potential of printing multiple bodies of clay in a single form with different properties. Initially, we used two different colored ceramic bodies as placeholders to develop this technique. However, we have since improved the method to print a high strength clay body for load bearing and a lightweight poses ceramic foam in the same brick for insulation. Ultimately, we envision using this approach to create walls made of a single ceramic material that vary in performance across their section, doing more with less. You can find more information on this project as well as the paper by scanning the QR code here. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Suleiman, and I am Adidas candidate. Uh, and my research focuses mainly on developing methods that deal with the material uncertainty for paste-based extrusion systems. Uh, in my research, it's, it's dealing with clay material uh, from the, looking at the field of computer science, uh, computer science, machine learning, and computer vision uh, to address the accuracy in construction. Uh, however, for this talk, uh, I am going to present a team effort project uh, that served as the main experimentation context for my research. Uh, this project focuses on developing a novel uh, printing technique for printing challenging lattice topologies with two key components. The first one being the design of a toolpath geometry, and the second one being the control of material extrusion in the fabrication process. Uh, to realize these two components, uh, we began the process by understanding the material with our hands. We extruded the clay beads and formed them into different topologies to see how can we control the material and how can we understand its limitation. Uh, and we found out that a clay loop is self-supported, which was very promising for us. Following our trajectories of crafting this loop with our hands, we digitized it. We introduced a variable speed parameter to control the material extrusion along the loop trajectory to enhance its uh, self-supported nature. Uh, we printed different loops with different heights to understand its effect on the outcome geometry. And with the loop morphology, we can return it back to create a return loop unit that can be repeated to create one level. And these levels can be stacked together to create uh, a building block. Uh, and we showed that this building block, if we were to compare it to one that is printed using a traditional uh, extrusion technique, printing horizontal in a horizontal fashion, layer by layer, we can save more than 50% of the material. And this means that we can print faster to achieve a similar height. Uh, however, as we build higher 
we add more weights to the lower layers that are not fully dry. Therefore, the lower layers tend to deflect and deform. And if the next layer is not adjusted, it will be printed in the air without anchoring itself to the most top recent printed layer. Uh, and here we saw an opportunity to make the extrusion system smarter, where we introduced a laser displacement sensor to measure the deflection of the printed loops to address them in the next layer for calibration and adjustments. We also added the horizontal layer, as you can see on the right, to grace the loops for lateral st stability and add more stiffness to the material system. Uh, with the sensor and the bracing layer, we can build highly calibrated lattice blocks with good structural performance. Uh, we can also scale up the lattice geometry and the print with different nozzle sizes. Uh, here you can see the developed responsive extrusion system used to build a large doubly curved surface where after it was dried, as you can see from the image, a global crack developed in the center, uh, splitting the printed block into two halves and a few other local minor cracks around the geometry as well. To address this issue, we introduced carbon fiber reinforcement to the clay mix to increase its structural capacity in compression and tension. And we use the material properties data from the structural testing to perform structural simulation, where we can inform design strategies to vary the density of the material across the lattice block. This opens up another uh, venue for a design feature where porosity is and can be controlled through the lattice block. Uh, in the final iteration, uh, we opted for a 2.1 meter tall inhabitable lattice structure where we employed our knowledge about the material, the enhancement of the material with the carbon fiber additive, the material extrusion control system that is being responsive and with an optimal tool path uh, design, we built it. And we built it in three days. Uh, and this is captured by this time uh, laps at the basement of the GSD, <laughs> proving the efficiency of the spatial printing for large uh, scale light structures. Uh, and these are some images uh, outside our school, the backyard. Interior shots. And one more shots at night inside the GSD. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saul. Let me share my screen. What am I sharing? Yes. Uh, I am here. There you go. All right. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Jose Luis. I am a doctor of design myself. I am part of the Material Processes and Systems Group, and I teach technology courses here at the GSD at the Design School. As you have seen from all of my colleagues uh, at the research group, we have a special interest in material processes. However, uh, in my particular case, uh, as much as I like doing physical things and as much as I'm interested in material properties, I rely on all my colleagues to uh, help me with that aspect of the research that we do, because I am personally perhaps a bit more interested in the computational aspects of how do we do things with machines and with materials. And in that sense, uh, some of the work that I've been developing in the last few years has been focusing on trying to understand how can we improve the relationship that we have with the machines that we use to make physical things. And in particular, I have been particularly interested in how we can enhance that communication by making sure that it's always happening somehow in a real time manner. So, for example, I would like to start by just touching on the typical workflow that we use for 3D printing things. When we want to 3D print something, what we typically do is like we come up with some 3D model in some kind of digital environment. So that is one abstraction. We follow that up with a second abstraction, which is taking that into a second software that does this kind of 
black box sort of uh, obscure process called slicing that turns that geometry into a set of layers with machine motions, etc., which then gets translated into a third medium, which is G-code, which is whatever machine instructions we need to actually make the machine make things. And then our role as designer ends there because then we just enter this code into a machine, we press play and we hope that that object gets fabricated. And if something goes wrong, we have to like backtrack several steps into a digital environment that has nothing to do with the material or the machine environment that we were hoping to make things with. So to me, that process works really well when we're focusing on production, we're focusing on precision, we're focusing on things that are not so much uh, taking a look at the design aspect of how do we make things. But most importantly, this process kind of breaks with a very long tradition that we have in society of um, the relation between us, the creators, the tools that we use to make things, and how do we make those in real time. There's been this distribution of craft and about making decisions with the tools that we use as we make physical things that was very important uh, when craft was the main means that we used to make physical things, but which we kind of have lost with the introduction of digital fabrication machines. So there are many authors that have advocated for this new paradigm called interactive fabrication, or the idea that these machines that we use should have some kind of means to um, be able to interact with them in real time. However, when I started thinking about these topics, I had found myself uh, not finding any kind of framework or any kind of method that systematically allowed us to make this happen, to make this real. So for me, the big question in my research was what, how can we open up that connection and how can we make the relation between us and the machines that we use more fluid so that we can think and design as we are making objects with digital fabrication machines. So for me, the I called the old paradigm, I call it the offline control system or the idea of working in a digital medium towards generating instructions to fabricate offline and detach from the system in a physical medium. Whereas what I'd like to contribute or what I'd like to offer to you uh, the world is perhaps this new paradigm of being more inactive and more uh, concurrent with the machines that we use to make physical things. So in that sense, many of you perhaps know this project that I've been working on for a few years now. It's called the Robot X Machina framework. And it's basically a set of tools for designers, for creators to systematically provide access to real-time control and real-time communications with, uh, in this case, industrial robotic arms. Because I believe, we believe in the group that the relation that we have with robots should be as fluid and as interacting as having a conversation with another human. So for me, this idea of being able to type an instruction and then have the robot immediately respond by enacting that instruction was not only something that felt natural and felt necessary. But we also found out through the research that it had a lot of advantages to um, how can we open up new design space in what we can do with these machines. And at the same time, it was really, really helpful in making the relation between humans and robots much closer or learning how can we activate and how can we control these machines. So for example, you have seen Sol's project, the responsive spatial, print trajectory, and how, for example, if we introduce real-time control in 3D printing mechanisms, we can systematically uh, correct, for example, then recalibrate layers when we are printing with materials that are not very solid, materials that are uh, more fluid, and therefore it makes the process of 3D printing much more reliable. The idea is that if we have an inactive system where um, through sensors, through prototyping boards, and through control mechanisms, we can have a close feedback loop between all the agents, then all of a sudden, all these new possibilities in 3D printing may actually arise. So another example could be, can we design objects as we are 3D printing them at the same time, concurrently in real time? So what you're seeing here is a very quick prototype that is based on Grasshopper, where we start off a simple cylinder. And then as the robot is printing the cylinder, 
we can actually decide that we want to change the cylinder and make some layers bigger and smaller. And the robot will always be responding in real time to that. If we as designers also incorporate in the system some constraints so that the size of the layers is not too big or too small so that we don't end up getting failures, then we have some kind of hybrid environment where there is some smartness and some logics about the rules of the 3D printing mechanism, but there is flexibility for the designer to make decisions as we are, as we are making those physical objects. So the closed feedback loop also stays there as the relation between the creator, the object that has been created, and the machine that is creating the object. Of course, you can imagine how this paradigm, the idea of real-time collaboration with robots, can open up a lot of new possibilities, for example, in the field of architecture. So if we are able to harness the power and the precision of industrial robotic arms to guide construction processes, but at the same time, we have humans on the loop that can instruct the robot to change a couple of things here, to adapt to some tolerances. And because the whole system is a feedback loop between the human and the robot, there is the possibility to introduce humans as brains, which make decisions in real time, which is what we humans are really good at doing. And then the system will be able to track those changes, incorporate them back into the as-built model, if you will, and therefore have a have a representation of the final object built in collaboration between humans and robots. We have experimented a lot in that aspect. We have made small pavilions. We have thrown workshops uh, in different institutions. And, uh, and it's been very interesting to see how there is a wish for this kind of collaboration, the collaboration between precision, between strength, and between human brains on the loop. Of course, I know you're all thinking, well, what about machine learning, right? Well, it turns out that machine learning as an industrial robot is just another partner that we can have on the loop and that we can harness to be able to collaborate in real time. So we can have multiple agents in an active system, robots, humans, and machine learning models talking to each other in real time. And this is made possible if we make this idea of systematically providing this possibility uh, as an option in the tools that we provide in the programming languages. And also, this can actually be really interesting and important in the arts. So the idea is that uh, there is a lot of creative expression that we can explore when it comes to uh, working in real time with robots. So this is some collaboration that we did with artist Merit, Merit Moore, a professional ballerina, where she was interested in the idea of creating choreographies where the human and the robot are some kind, somehow having a real-time conversation, just like you would with a human partner that you're trying to dance with, right? Um, this, actually, we were lucky enough to take this project and some of these experiments to America's Got Talent and to one of the auditions. And it was a really, really fun experience for all of us. But as Martin has suggested before in his presentation, for us, one of the most interesting things and most important things in the group is to make sure that we understand the effects of the designs on the people that we are trying to target. So for us, the idea of creating a platform for real-time robotics, it becomes, <laughs> sorry for all the laughter, for us, it's very important to understand what are the effects, what are the cognitive effects of the things that we design for other people. So in that sense, we try to systematically take uh, tests and do user testing to understand uh, how people react to the things that we design and get feedback, and then be able to incorporate that feedback to improve the cognitive aspects of this human machine collaboration. So in a nutshell, we are very interested in the idea of human computer interaction, both at the level of computers, machines, artificial intelligence, neural networks, but with humans at the center with the goal of being able to augment the way we think, the way we design, and our intelligence, um, which is also part of our mission as educators in higher education. And a lot of the work that we do with our students, with our teaching, and being able to help people understand that this could be a potential new avenue for them to explore their creativity and to be more expressive. So, with that, I would like to thank everyone for being here today in this set of presentations. I would like to thank my colleagues for the time 
uh, to do this presentation. I would also like to thank the Digital Future teams for having given us the opportunity to share some of the work that we do at the group with the rest of the world. And I think at this point, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Neil, we might be able to open it up to questions. Yeah, ab absolutely. Thanks, Jose, and thank you. Thank you, team. That was really a, an amazing series of presentations there. Um, we, I just wanted to those of us following, and there's quite a few following on, on live stream on, on YouTube. Um, uh, if you have any questions, please put them into the chat and we can uh, relay them here. Um, I just want to maybe just, just kick things off. There are, there are a few maybe distinctions that I wanted to or, or did want to pick up on. Um, <clears throat> One of the things I think that that maybe that, that wasn't mentioned, but it makes the the GSD kind of special, is is the relationship with MIT. I noticed that a couple of you have been teaching at MIT or studied at MIT. This kind of very curious relationship. And I, I think what is extraordinary is the possibility that you know, a student from 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 the GSD can go and do courses at, at MIT, and a student from MIT. Uh, can go and study the GSD, and there's this incredible interchange. There's a long history of of faculty between the two institutions. Maybe um, uh, uh, Martin Jose, you'd like to sort of say something about that MIT uh, interface. Are you bringing the M word to this forum, Neil? <laughs> oh boy, I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> no, it's a good point. I think there's there's a couple of perspectives, right? This for the students, again, like you said, they have an amazing array of courses. They take at both schools, they can use both libraries. It's uh it's it's amazing. So for faculty, um, on occasion there's collaborative projects. Um we even had jointly taught classes on occasion. It's really is a it's 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 more about instructors deciding to do this. It's it's not really we have policies around this, but everybody is free to do it. So I think it's it's quite flexible. Um on the research end, I think we there are there are some areas where we do related things, I would say, but by and large the efforts are actually quite different. So um but I think it's it's sort of um in a way, for us, maybe MIT is the kind of intellectual sparring partner, um, which is really great to have that. Uh, keeps us on our toes. Uh, and uh, but yeah, we we also we have friend exchanges, and we we know a lot of the colleagues there, and it's a it's a it's a very it's a very good relationship, you know. I mean, maybe just to say for those who don't realize that uh, MIT and 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 Harvard are both on the same side of the Charles River, and they are kind of. Not quite as adjacent, but there. I mean, there is. There are some universities where there's Beidar and Xinhua. They're literally separated by one street, but it's a it's a very very close relationship. And when I was teaching there, I would, you didn't have to go across the other side of the Charles River to bring in some really interesting people to come and to come and join in. It was really an astonishing thing. The second question in terms of distinctions was just to kind of clarify um, for for everyone. I mean, there are these two routes: the 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 PhD and the DDES. Now, it seems to me, uh, as a kind of relative outside of these days, that actually the DDES has grown in a certain sort of way, so that it's actually kind of, in so many ways, kind of similar to the PhD, um, uh, but different. And, and I suppose maybe if you could just articulate what is the difference between the DDES and, and, and the PhD in terms of the uh, the way it's perceived. And, and I guess, you know, my other question would be, does the word design uh, or the design in DDES allow you to operate in a different way in terms of what you're producing compared to the PhD? So I can give some of my perspective. I used to be director of the DDES program for years and I'll, I'll be actually doing it again, helping out the uh, colleague uh, next semester. So um, at Harvard, the PhD is actually part of the Faculty of Arts and Science, which is very strange. The Faculty of Arts and Science is basically the college and the PhD program within the within FAS. So, uh, and FAS rules a PhD at Harvard. Okay, so even though we have a PhD program at the school, it's actually officially administered by the FAS. We're just kind of running it. Uh, now, the the areas of investigation our PhD program are by and large theoretical, historical in nature. There, there's very few people who are working essentially on computational topics in relation to building performance and environmental technologies. That's very few, but by and large, it's history and theory. The DDES is much broader. It's also much more radically interdisciplinary. Uh, and it's been like that from the get-go. 
I think we, in the DDoS, we see, in fact, the advisory committees where we have folks from other disciplines, and as is the case actually for everybody on the call, right? They all have actually, as Dan, Katarina, I'm really looking at you, you all have a scientist of some of some background on your committee, right? That doesn't happen in a PC program. And my my pyramid diagram, of course, was just meant to say, well, they're both getting a doctor degree with the same level of contribution, but the, the outlook is actually very different. Uh, so the, the PC tend to produce scholars uh, that then look for positions in history and theory. The DDoS can teach design studio, they can teach technology classes, but they also do more conceptual work, uh, Think of Rania's work at, at MIT. So I think they're they're close to design and to the practice of design. I mean, guess that what you you do have, I think, at the, the the GSD is somebody who does straddle. I mean, Antoine is is kind of one of the few examples of of the kind of history theory criticism who actually engage with the world of computation. And there is there is something that I still don't understand because I have a background in that area. Why there's such antagonism, as it were, towards computation in that domain? But never mind. That's that's a uh, that's a kind of significant um, uh, uh, contribution that, that we make. But just what I mean, just maybe to pick up on the word design a little bit, and I hate to mention the M word again, Jose, but one of the things that kind of always kind of, I wouldn't say troubled me, but struck me about the kind of the way in which the, the media lab was, was approaching was approaching things was that there was always a tension between whether you were doing kind of, as it were, scientific research or whether you were doing design. And, and how do you see that being played out in, in, in the DDES? I mean, um, to what extent has, I mean, a lot of this work was beautiful, right? It looked really very good, but to what extent uh, is there a tension between the kind of the, the pure scientific and, and the, the urge to make it into a, a designer project in terms of visuals? Mm. I'm not sure I would describe it as a tension. I think if so, it's, it's a productive one as in science is about what we know and design is what we want to achieve. But uh, so for me, these are completely complementary viewpoints. They're each incredibly valid and, and one needs the other. Uh, now, the fact that design needs science, we've known that for a long time. But I think now a lot of scientists realize that actually that might need design as well. Because if you think about design, how it has evolved, think of just about, uh, sorry, to think about science, specifically material science, they're actually not designing new materials, right? So there are design activities on a very, very small scale. But even beyond that, I think often what we find in our collaborations, uh, we bring sort of a, a somewhat, um, we're bringing new perspectives to the scientific work. We're bringing new questions. Um, and, and I think it's um, for those scientists who have the patience to indulge the work with us, they actually enjoy it. So I wouldn't say there's a tension in the program at large. Uh, I think the students who work with scientists are most likely on this call, okay? So it's not that a vast majority of the data students work with scientists, right? Most of them work in a more disciplinary way, in, in a broadly disciplinary way. Um, they might have a social scientist uh, that is more a planner working on economical or social problems in the city. So these are slightly more disciplinary setups. Uh, the kind of more radical engagement of scientists who would not have stepped in our design school. I think that happens mostly in the computational slash uh, materials area. And I think it's it's a very productive coexistence. And um, I showed this one slide, but we had listing our collaborative partners. I think there's a growing understanding that uh, we might actually need each other. And it's not just that some of our decisions as designers will have to be based on science. I mean, many of our decisions will never be based on science, I think, you know, there's no doubt about it, but but some could be, right? So, but I think the, the awareness from the other side is, is also growing that uh, science might need design. I want to remind you, um, when we started another master's program here that I'm running, uh, master in design engineering uh, eight years ago, IBM announced, and you know, they're basically computer science, right? IBM announced they were hiring 1,000 designers. You know? I mean, they're going big, 1,000, right? Uh, and it wasn't just about interfaces. It's, it was more, it was actually bringing design and design approaches, design strategy, most potentially to the corporation. So I think those are really interesting moments and we see this happening in a broader way. And I think for that reason also, the DDoS is a much more agile kind of program, able to adjust and, and kind of lead in this change. PC, a more traditional, wonderful, 
very good quality sort of scholarly setup by and large, right? I also think, I also think Neil, this relates a, a bit more to the broader question of um, of design research or the idea that um, for the good or the bad, one of the main mediums that we have in academia to broadcast the knowledge that we generate is, is, is scholarly papers. And in the field of scholarly papers, like um, the, we have a very strong tradition of methods and validation that come from the sciences and that are very quantitative. It's like about proving numbers, proving methods, et cetera, et cetera. But within design, making those quantitative assessments, sometimes it's just not so easy. It's actually quite challenging. And perhaps in your case, Neil, who I believe you are someone who also dives a lot into theory, criticism, making papers about theory, like how do you actually back those assessments? How do you prove them? Is something that is more qualitative very often. And no matter how many user tests we try to do, how we try to understand the impacts of the work that we do on people, Sometimes it's just the methods, the academic systems of paper, it's just difficult uh, as a matching medium for design research. And that is a tension that all of us as designers at some point, I do think that we feel, what do you think about that, Neil? No, I mean, I, I mean, I also run a DDES program and we decided to kind of let, allow the possibility of there being kind of three modalities, the, the kind of the strict kind of scientific thing, the scientific method. And then the kind of, let's say, for the history theory side of thing, the more discursive uh, kind of way, which is you're not trying to structure it in certain ways. And in many ways, you're not trying to solve problems. You're trying to ask questions. So that and it's left more in the structure, let's say, of a book. You know, you don't try and kind of systematically kind of construct it in a certain way. And then there's the design component where, uh, uh, where you, there can be design. And that's why we chose to push for DDES as a title. Or there can be any any mixture between them but I, I think it's it is an interesting challenge where you I mean I, I'm a great believer in, in interdisciplinary interdisciplinarity but the one of the challenges you get is is that you you actually face different interpretations in the sense that you can have the same word and seen in different sort of ways I mean just for Martin I would say that kind of like uh, famously uh, Walter Benjamin comments on the word bread right and you could translate that into German what or you can translate that into French pan and they mean bread, but what they mean by bread is fundamentally different, right? You get this solid rye bread you could build a house with, right, in Germany, whereas you get the baguettes that are light and fluffy in France. And I and I also come across this in the, in the sense when you you come across, let's say, the word space. If you look at sociology, the word space is is to do with spatial practices, and you look at it as an architect and say, what are they talking about? And you realize that the same word is used in different sort of ways. And the word design itself is interesting because. If you're, I've got a friend who works in, in, in the other Cambridge in England in, uh, on in the science park, and he designed circuit boards and, and things like that. You know, and when you design a circuit board, it's the different concept of design. You're not concerned about aesthetics. It's got to be a neat, let's say, a layout, but it's not about aesthetics. And this is where you get a challenge, I think, when you bring into, into uh, all these different disciplines together a kind of a, a different way of interpreting, understanding certain words. Yeah. Okay, just, yeah, a couple of things uh, come to my mind. One, definitely the sort of what design is, is different things to different people. I kind of live this daily because I'm I'm running a program in the design engineering space with our engineering school. And for them, design is basically, here's a problem, solve it. It's, it's a solution to a problem. And that is part of what design is. We, we to some degree, do this at the, the people on this call and that this community, but for us, design is also spending a lot of time in the problem space and, and asking the questions, right? And coming up with new questions so we can come up with different answers. So, um, and that's, uh, uh, and I also relate very much to your sort of, um, um, your thoughts on the, what words mean. I remember uh, when we started the collaboration with scientists from the Wies Institute here in Boston, uh, a large scientific organization, medical material research, about 500 scientists. Uh, we spent a lot, and we spent a lot of meetings sort of trying to trying to understand each other on a very basic level. And I remember one word getting hung up was the word small, because right? <laughs> when they say small, they're basically meaning nanoscale. This is physically what is small for them. For us, small you know, is is not nanoscale, right? Nanoscale wasn't even on our radar screen, really, right? Because we hadn't we had no methods of working in that space. So, I think understanding and having the patience to bridge those differences and appreciating them, I think, is fundamental 
to succeed. You know, it, it, you just have to kind of work through the culture shock, right, of these different disciplines. And I actually quite enjoy those moments and that work, but it, it's it, it reads it needs patience, you know. Um, but I think it's I see a lot more appetite for, and that's really encouraging. I think. Yeah, maybe I mean one one area I guess which I, which I find is kind of interesting in terms of breaking down those siloed boundaries that we've inherited is the is the domain of AI and uh, in a strange way I mean both AI and neuroscience come together that's one thing I would say that's kind of interesting how many AI specialists have got a background in in neuroscience Demis Osabis did a PhD in neuroscience and so on and meanwhile Anil Seth who's one of the leading neuroscientists did a PhD in AI so that's an interesting it's also I guess an arts and science kind of collaboration. They come together in a kind of interesting way as well. But then also in, in, interestingly as well, there's the corporate world, which is surprisingly, uh, there's a kind of in, uh, academia and, and, and the corporate world come together. The one challenge I do see with AI, and I want to basically ask uh, Daniel a question, um, is, 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 is in a way um, you're dealing with AI in a completely immaterial domain versus, I mean, this focus of this, this, this research group is very much materiality per, per se. And I'm, I, the one thing I, I missed, and my, my apology if I didn't really pick up on your thing, because was there's a lot of information there, but how did you get from the kind of, um, the images that have been, um, were, were generated through machine learning? I mean, I guess we're familiar with how images are now becoming kind of, Redimensionalize. I mean, George Guido was part of our project, and uh, Daniel Bolajan has been some doing some really interesting work on on that um, in our series on AI. But what I think, what I I struggle with a little bit is how you can um, see material properties in what comes out of that system. I mean, you can simulate certain things, but do those original um, what is generated through that process? I mean. Are you mapping on material properties or how, how do it relate to material properties? Is that a, a fair question or? Um... Yeah, no, of course. Yeah. Love to talk about that further. Yeah. I mean, for me, the, the real conceptual part of the project is, you know, using images to describe material distributions. And by that, I mean, the sort of arrangement of different kinds of materiality. So through multi-material printing, um, we can essentially, you know, assign materials at the voxel layer, you know, so all the way down to sort of 60 microns or something like that. And so thinking about essentially materiality as these channels that we can control, you know, outside of just XYZ where something is in the position, but sort of, you know, define some sort of, in this case, it was about like the active nature of the, of the material itself. So my material distributions then describe essentially how, how much of the swellable material gets deposited in any single voxel. And then, you know, there's a little bit of, you know, since it's a bilayer structure, it matters whether it's on the top or the backside, because that affects how, um, you know, which the direction, what the direction of curvature is. Um, but yeah, it's, it's understanding that, you know, um, materials can be heterogeneous and we can design them in that way. And that the sort of like, the interiorness of a BREP that we don't tend to think about is really an op is a realm for design. It's an area in which we can uh, work it. And so that's sort of the starting point of the project. And then, you know, the, uh, the images that get produced by the CPPN then you know, demonstrate, you know, essentially where the active material goes. And then we can simulate that and use that to drive this sort of image based uh, machine learning algorithms that get used down the line, which are again, translating three-dimensional information through the RGB channels. So again, it's all about, you know, 3D into 2D and like matter and material being captured in this sort of image format. So that was, you know, that's really the, the sort of polemic in, in the project is, you know, let's, let's make these things real. Let's, you know, make ML um, physical and deal with active behaviors in the process. Um, can I just, I mean, we just mentioned we got a, one question, I think, in the chat, um, uh, uh, but uh, maybe invite others. Before we move on to that question, maybe Suleiman, I could just ask you a question. I, Because I, I, I think one of the, <clears throat> I, I, a long time ago, I had a, um, a, 
I was collaborating with Bera Neves and we worked on 3D printing a project for NASA on the moon and Mars. And the real problem was was material slump. You know, you can print it, you can you've got the model, uh, the digital model, but then what happens is it, it slumps. And and what I understand from you, what you're doing is there's a kind of feedback loop whereby you can correct this in some ways. Now, but what I didn't quite pick up on is how do you actually correct it? Do you just carry on printing more or do you thicken things or exactly how does it uh is it how is it exactly corrected and and, and as you modify it in real time yeah of course uh, thanks neil yeah uh, i would be happy to clarify that so the correction or the feedback or the real-time calibration system works by capturing deflection because once we print these loops or these structures they deflect after printing uh, not only due to self-weight, but also due to the drying process and also due to the force that is imposed by uh, the material being pushed outside from the nozzle because the nozzle is pulling the material as it goes into constructing these intricate loops, right? Uh, so we uh, create a tool path that guide a displacement sensor to this critical location and measure the discrepancy between the digital and the collected measurement and address this in the next layer. So the next layer will actually be uh, printed in this correct position. But again, like the amount of data we get from these sensors uh, are usually limited to just calculating this one uh, uh, dimension, which is the Z deflection, then there's this question, how can we enhance this sensor te technology to, to capture the other dimension as well, because it's, it's, it's so critical for this uh, complex geometry. And uh, this is where uh, my next research or my current research is, is dealing with. And Hope, hope that uh, clarifies it. Well, yeah. it, it, does, yeah. it does. I was just thinking about, I, I don't know if you know uh, Melody Yasha, who is a, a kind of space architect, but but she um, she has similar kind of approaches. And of course, when you're working on, um, and now it's become a big thing, right? They're, we're actually thinking about printing things on, on, on the moon and Mars. But uh, she, I mean, the, the key question about the moon, I mean, in terms of curing processes, is the extreme range of temperatures that you get there from almost absolute zero to plus 200 and so on and 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 uh, and the fact that actually it's well all the i mean a lot there's a lot of um of, of real challenging questions so i mean i could see that application being useful in the in the space industry and i with uh, with um with brock and i we well brock actually wanted nasa is a good source of funding so is it maybe there's a tip there that maybe you could take that further into uh, extraterrestrial uh, exploration um I believe yeah. Solomon is actually working on a really, really interesting new method to for this lattice 3D printing. I don't know how much he wants to disclose because it's part of his currently ongoing research that is still unpublished. Yeah, it's yeah. it's 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 exciting. It's exciting, and uh, maybe just a tease uh, into my uh, some of the finding I I I found in my dissertation or my current thesis is that. The amount of data that we can gather from these sensors are so huge. And then there's this question, how can we use this data to actually uh, predict on the fly the deflections, right? Before actually we send it to the uh, constructor uh, construction to, to be constructed on, or manufactured. And this uh, provide designer a tool to, to be more creative because they get on the fly predictions on the final outcome before it gets fabricated. So that bridges the gap between design manufacturing and uh, creativity as well. Yeah. I wanna, I wanna throw Dan under the bus also as well because <laughs> he is defending on Monday. <laughs> he's got a lot of stuff that he couldn't share today yet, but he's going to very soon. Uh, show us a lot of what he's been up to lately, which is super, super exciting. He's literally defending in less than 48 hours. <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> no, well, I don't, don't remind. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, I, I, I think one of the real challenges in terms of research is, is that actually it's not necessarily to do just with doctoral presentations, but there's a lot that's not disclosed because under non-disclosure agreements. And uh, certainly that's the problem in much AI research right now, that people won't, can't, are not allowed to be forthcoming on what's going on. So it's going to arrive on our doorstep suddenly, you know, whatever this software that's been developing in three years' time or something, and we won't know about it, but because people can't talk about it. And I think that's the huge challenge that goes on in, in terms of, of, of research. Yeah, but I mean, I, I agree. I think it's, it really depends on where you want to publish, right? Some journals will literally ask you to confirm that you have not disclosed it, right? And and that's scientific, that's common in this in the more scientific world, right? In in the more architectural journals that are maybe a little bit more design focused, practice focused, theory focused, you won't find that uh, form, right? You they're they're happy to and people are happy to share. So different cultures, right? I think it actually goes back to our discussion on working between these disciplines, you know. Uh, not just do they have different languages, they have different customs, different values, and you have to kind of navigate that space in between, you know. So we we tend to keep things a bit under the hood un until they're done, right? <laughs> so you first patent, then paper, and then we're going to talk about them. Right? Yeah. <laughs> can, can I just quickly ask, I, I don't help the space here, but but the, uh, one question for mainly Ka Katarina, but maybe also uh, for Marula in some ways, uh, and that is, you know, I... What I'm getting the sense of in terms of this effective computing is that almost we've gone through a new transition just recently. I mean, of course, Rosalind Picard, I shan't say where she's from, but, <laughs> but anyway, um, was de has developed the notion of effective computing. But now we're getting all sorts of kind of spin-offs that are, that are happening. I mean, my other student, Raya Riyad, who's working on the similar area, and she's been working with Affectivo as a kind of as a commercial company and things. And I really get the sense that that world has come of age in the last um, year or so. I mean, do you like to sort of comment on 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 how you see that happening? Because you know, I didn't see that before. I didn't see that kind of world. I know Ben Asferi's worked quite well. I never saw that level, and suddenly we we're really immersed in a very serious way in effective computing. Yeah, sure, Neil. I'm happy to speak on that a little bit. I mean, I think. Um, we, we've seen it in the built environment in the world of architecture a little bit, but under more the title of um, uh, environmental psychology, in the sense that we, you know, in the 80s and the, um, and the 90s, there was this interest around how does the built environment actually affect us psychologically. Um, but the problem was, is that the technology itself wasn't necessarily there to support the level of rigorous sort of data acquisition that we might need as designers to supplement what you know, previously was mainly relied on as surveys um, or more subjective understanding of how we perceive our environments. So uh, what kind of effective computing has brought to the table is this level of understanding how we can use data uh, technology and uh, real-time metrics, such as the physiological metrics I mentioned in my presentation, to understand how we are continuously adapting and changing and how people are responding to our spaces. And in turn, I mean, through effective computing, you're doing it through software where you're responding immediately to someone's perhaps mood or cognition to so that software um, AI can be more kind of effective or emotionally intelligent. And I think what we're gonna see um, is in the next 10, 15 years is that this kind of static world that we live in, which is the built environment, is going to become increasingly adaptive and uh, responsive in the same way that our software and our, our kind of all of these metrics that are continuously being collected are going to feed into this. And I think the work that I'm doing and, and Marula is doing um, really is looking at getting ahead of that and seeing, okay, well, if this, if this data and this type of effective computing approach to architecture is gonna be adapted and be more prevalent, how can we put in place rigorous studies to back these decisions that we make in this adaptive environment? And so Marula, maybe you wanna follow up, yeah. Sure, yes, to add up on to what Katarina just said, I believe that Effective computing, and really there can be many terms explaining this field of work. It could be effective computing, but when we think of materials, it's a situation of augmented materiality. It's really about getting information and data and being able to 
understand and track and record things that are would be otherwise invisible. Uh, th those could be physiological signals or in Katharina's case or in my work, it's the way that our body responds to the light that it gets or th there are many, many examples, but I think the main distinction is and the, what for me, what it really brings to the table is this visibility of signals that would be otherwise not uh, aware of. Okay. Um... Uh, we have a question. I mean, it's a very pragmatic question in the chat. So I guess, but maybe I should sort of uh, maybe raise it since it's on the chat. Um, so uh, it's and and I guess it's on everyone's mind when they, when they're thinking about applying for doctoral research places. Roughly, how much would it cost to attend and complete uh, one of these GSD programs from a master's or for a PhD? Are there tuition covering scholarships available? Great presentations, thank you. I mean, every time we get one of those questions, but it, maybe it's worth uh, just kind of floating it out there because that becomes, it is an issue, I think, in many ways. I know, of course, it's an issue. So, oh, yeah, that's a very practical one. That, yeah, uh, I don't actually have the price tag now, but uh, it's, it's, um, there is pretty substantial financial aid available um, for almost all our programs. Um, the DDS has about 75% sort of uh, of tuition is covered. Uh, uh, master's programs in general have financial aid, including some aid for international students. Um, so it's really case by case. Um, most of the uh, doctoral work is independent of the support is independent of need and merit. It's, it's simply we have standard rules. Uh, masters tends to be most of it is need based and some of it is merit based, but I would encourage those who have questions on that just go to the GC website. It is a kind of big topic, but understood. It's uh, it's it's pretty challenging, right? Uh, but I would encourage uh, those of you interested to kind of just go to the GC website and uh, and take a detailed look at each program. I mean, just to maybe pick up on not necessarily the cost thing of it, but I mean, I think a lot of programs you have to do a master's before you do the doctorate I mean right I think Neri was the only one in the media lab whoever didn't who went in without a master's but is that the case of the, the GSD you have to do a master's there first well actually the media lab also has a if you do it in what used to be Neri's group you have to do a master's first it's kind of gets rolled into the PhD but you get a master's first so DDS you yeah you will have to have a professional degree Right, so that in many cases is a master's. In some some cases, it might be BR, right? But you have it's a you gotta have a professional de degree. That is not the case in the PC program. You can do PC with a bachelor, uh, so it's quite different. A lot of our data students have prior experience professionally research, so they don't come here straight from a master's degree. Right? That isn't necessarily the norm, but it's quite typical. Um, it does kind of I think help in a way the the research to sort of reach its audiences there's just simply more to build from right i mean just what one one question on that because they the, the in the the other cambridge right in the uk they had a different system i'm not quite sure if it's still there i mean it's that you have the dedicated master's course that you could do and i mean uh, there was a whole kind of research field going right. on there in the martin center and so on but there was also a way of doing a, doing a PhD where you would start off not registered for a PhD, but as a master's. And that was somehow commuted into a PhD. So you didn't get a separate master's, but you, it became a, a building block, as it were, that you then developed. Is that, does that happen to the GSD at all? I mean, we have some doctoral students, most in the DDS, who, who come sort of from a master's within the school. It's actually a small number, you know. Uh, there's no policies around it. It, it, it really, we look at everybody sort of equally, but some folks might do an, an, an MRC or an MDES or other degree here, and then basically apply again, like everybody else to the doctoral program and are being reviewed at like everybody else um, and, and will then get in. And I think, uh, Jose Luis, that was a case for you and also for Carolina, right? Uh, you both did MDES degrees here and then, um, eventually go into the doctoral program. And Suleiman. So, yeah, of course, yes, yeah, yeah, sorry, yes. D okay. I, again, I don't ask too many questions but myself, but I've got one question for Sarah, because I've just been to India and I was uh, gave a couple of lectures in, in Mumbai and I was at the uh -huh. at, uh, 
uh, at Sept in in Ahmedabad, which was which was fascinating. Um, I think I even remember. I think you visited uh, my old school. I think Balwin State School of Architecture. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, in fact, I know about that. No, no, that's a great school, and and uh, Bavlin Kaur, who's on the Digital Futures team, is was there yeah, as well. Yes. So I mean, it's a a, a fascinating school, I, and I I, I love that space. It was really interesting. Um, uh, but one question, like I, this, is a general question, right? And, and, and you know, India has produced a lot, and in the world of theory, for example, Homi Baba, we had a session on Homi Baba. He's obviously at Harvard as well. But one of the big questions I have about India is is that we, you know we. I mean, if you go to Silicon Valley, anyway, in San Francisco, you basically you hear Indian accents the whole time, right? And you you see people playing, playing cricket everywhere, and um, and yet in architecture, in the world of architecture, there is almost like nothing. I mean, not going to say nothing, but there's very very little happening in that domain. Now, outside of India, you get um, uh, uh, um, uh, um, I'm just blanking on his name now. The guy at, 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 uh, working for Zaha. Um, uh, um, Shaji Bhushan, right? and his brother as well, and 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 there there are a number of, of individuals who are leading research uh, centers uh, outside, but outside of India. But but do you see within India India itself a kind of a, an up, upswelling of of interest in in computation? Because I'm I'm just waiting for this explosion to happen when when all of a sudden India starts generating all these. Uh, uh, all these uh, computationally advanced um, uh, 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 students. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting you ask this question because even like uh, when I did my bachelor's in BSSA, like long time back, and uh, at that time I was very much interested in ideas of parametric architecture and computational design. But at that time, like there, it was there was not much scope. And this I'm talking about uh, in terms of 2013 or something. And a lot of the concepts and techniques about these is something which I learned just via YouTube, you know, and it's all was all about like learning from peers, learning from someone else who has learned it from YouTube. So that was what the culture was there. And that's what sort of enabled me to sort of, okay, I want to go and actually learn this myself. And that's why I applied for masters uh, here at the JSD. And because I applied for the master's in design technology, I ended up getting a chance to like learn all of these things. And now I've been working in research for almost like eight years now. And for me, it's always very sort of interesting, even some of the questions which Jose mentioned earlier about the idea of craft and computation and how there could be like an interesting sort of blend between both these things. And coming from India, knowing that there's a very rich sort of vernacular craft, the use of materials, I see that there's a lot that can happen in terms of looking at computation and that craft together as a hybrid, not one replacing the other. But I also see within like the sort of silos that you spoke about, uh, about you have academia and then you have industry for all of these research to happen. A, within academia, different schools, design, science need to be talking to each other on one level. But I think there was also some question about like funding, right? Like industry is very vital in terms of playing a role in that. Like, so how can we have different schools, different domains within academia come together with industry partners and that can enable a lot of this funding. And I think that is somewhere where there could can be quite a bit of improvement in terms of realizing that all these three hmm. stakeholders are needed, you know, to advance this in India itself. If I may, I have the perception that India is a powerhouse for computational interests. Right now, I run this parallel project called Parametric Camp. It's very similar in spirit to Digital Futures. It's about opening access to knowledge. It's a bit more technical, so less talks, less interviews, and more tutorials and stuff. But if you look at the statistics of the YouTube channel, uh, the main audience is the US, but the second, very, very close, is India. And it's not a matter of numbers. It's a matter of interest, because they're by far the people that participate the most in the discussions, in the live chat, in the Discord server that we have, it's incredible the amount of interest and the amount of, of, of intellect that is there. And I, I think to your point, Neil, I foresee that we're going to see more and better coming from India and Indian people in this field. Yeah, I, I just to say I had a discussion a long time back with uh, um, uh, with Lars Hesselgren, who I think was the, the charge of computation at uh, KPF, um, was it Gensler? KPF, I think. And, and he said, 
I'm I'm sure there's a, a kind of a, a, an undiscovered tribe of computation. He did there two actually. One's in India, one's in China, and he and he his his task was to was to try and find them. But Jose, maybe I could pick up on just one thing because there's one thing that we obviously share. You have a a kind of a, a, you also do podcasts and on your on your teaching and things and share those around the world, which is really what Digital Futures does in a different kind of way. And um, and it's really about this. I mean, the, the in some senses, what we've also had in in terms of um, uh, digital futures discussions about the nature of education itself, and I think that is fundamentally shifting in many ways. Um, one of the comments we had uh, Sanjay Sama gave, and I shan't say which university he was from, but Sanjay Sama, uh, who is um, uh, has written a book on these things, he was saying, you know, really, actually. If you want to find about anything these days, you go to YouTube. There's more information on YouTube than than than, than anywhere, and uh, it strikes me that the, kind of in a way, the old model we used to have, um, certainly when I was a student at the other Cambridge, was that you know the professor came and had the certain information. They just simply kind of unloaded, right? You had this incredible lecture, all this information and things, and that doesn't necessarily work anymore. You know, uh, especially when you've got a domain where, which is changing the whole time and. Uh, um, so increasingly, it seems to me that what needs to happen um, is, is that the professor needs to change the role and become more a kind of curiosity stimulator. This is the term that Areti Makopoulou expressed when we had a discussion. But also, I think that just in terms of the kind of the whole nature of things is that, is that, is that you know, especially, so let's say, in the world of AI, where things are changing so rapidly. We had George Guida, I mentioned on our, our, our um, AI tutorials, and by the time we finish the series, we were saying we better start a game because it's out of date by now. Things are changing kind of so rapidly. And you kind of wonder, how is it possible for any institution to operate in a, in a world where the goalposts are changing every day? And, you know, and it's almost impossible for anyone to keep up with things. Therefore, at least what my, from my view, from digital teachers' role is to try and create a platform for a kind of global classroom, shall we say, where we can share ideas and bring together the top people in the world who, who are really at the cutting edge of things so as to share that information. And, and I just wonder what, what was your motivation by, behind the podcasts that, that you offer um, that are also hugely, hugely popular? It's funny that you mentioned George. He was my student here. He did his thesis with me and with Andrew. And he actually, <laughs> his thesis was text to image. And he presented and defended it in May. And I was like, you have to write a paper about this right now. And then he got distracted because he was getting married and that kind of stuff, you know. And then Dali was published three weeks after his defense. But totally. So, like, that speaks very strongly to the pace of how AI is evolving and how technology is just something that it's very difficult to catch up to. I think, to your point, I see our role as educators very much in the curatorial space. Or, if you will, perhaps in the... Um, almost in the storytelling space. Because at the end of the day, many of the things that I teach, let's say most of the things that I teach are things that doing the right research, reading the right papers, reading the right books, et cetera, anyone could pretty much figure out on their own. But I think the value that I bring to my teaching, the value that I bring in, 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 in academia, the value that I bring to the videos that I make in YouTube, et cetera, is more about how do I perceive the world? How do I perceive certain technologies? How do I connect them with certain design intentions? And then how do I craft the story around those technologies, how I present them to students, and how do I connect the dots? And at, that, at any level, that is a very opinionated uh, enterprise. It just happens that, that being the one who is in that curatorial role and who chooses what needs to be presented at which point, and how do you group that into the story of a class or a playlist or a seminar or whatever, I think it's the value that we add as educator. It's not very different from what museums do. You could see art, you can see art everywhere, but when you go to a museum, you see the version of the art world that that museum is trying to present to you. You may or may not agree with them. You may have criticism around them. And that is perfectly fine because we're entitled to our own opinion. But some people have more affinity with certain museums than with others. Some people have more affinity with certain YouTubers than others or with certain professors and others. And this is a little bit of what, at the end of the day, 
teaching and academia and education is about. That's how I see it these days, especially, in, as you say, in a world where access to knowledge now has been fairly democratized, especially now even more with the tendency for, for example, uh, papers being published under open access and breaking down paywalls from big editorial companies, et cetera. I see that trend growing further, which I really enjoy and I like. And so at the end of the day, it's more about uh, education as curation, perhaps. We we should we should wrap things up now. We're just coming up to to uh, approximately two hours, and it's been a, a pretty a packed information packed full session. Um, uh, 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 I just mentioned to everyone that uh, uh, who's watching that we have all the sessions. We have all our insider sessions, and all the other sessions are all uploaded to the Digital Futures um, uh, Library, um, uh, which is online and freely accessible to all. Um, and uh, also, uh, Jose, maybe could you could you just mention the name of how, what your series is called, so they could also um, my series your podcast that you do. Oh, it's yeah, it's called Parametric Camp with double C. It's a YouTube channel. If you just Google Parametric Camp, very easy to find. Yeah. Also, I have a very long name that is very Googleable, <laughs> so that will point you to very easily to that YouTube channel. <laughs> it's impossible to remember your name. <laughs> Uh, I should just say, mention that George Gieder actually married one of my my teaching assistants from from the GST. So, uh, <laughs> yes. uh, wonderful, nice story there. But, the um, computational world is very small. <laughs> <laughs> well, she wasn't so computational, but anyway, but anyway. So, um, thank you so much for this. This is, I mean, uh, this is going to be one of our best sessions. I mean, it's such incredible work that you guys are doing. Um, I like the way it's got a focus on materiality, which we don't necessarily see in computation. That's uh, it raises its, its challenges, but it also makes it very interesting and very relevant. I also think the human-centered nature of the research, which I think is was was one of the high points of the, those presentations today. I thought that was really beautiful stuff. So thank you for these amazing presentations. Um, and uh, as I say, it'll be part of our repository along with with your rivals and, and the places like ICD and it has. But I think you know, in a way. I said, you know, Akin was teaching at the GSD when I was there. So there's an interconnectedness. And I saw that you were working in there with Etahau and, and using the thing. It's just great. So in a sense, we're all we're all learning together in a way. We're all learning together, in it together as one world. It's I mean, yeah, it's I'm very relaxed about it. Sure. I mean, just, I mean, it's, it, I don't know if you know this, but I used, to, I, I used to be a Latin translator in my good days gone by. And the word computare means to think together. So in a sense, we are all thinking together, a kind of swarm intelligence that's going on at the moment, which is, uh, makes it uh, super special. But um, yeah. so thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Martin. And thank you so much, Jose Luis. It was, and thank you for the presenters. It was, and, and it was amazing. And, and finally, uh, and, and also thank you to, uh, good luck to Daniel for 48 years, hours time. I will also thank the Digital Futures time that have, um, uh, the team that has been behind everything. You don't know this. I always make the comment, it's a bit like an iceberg. You see 10%, but there's a lot of work that goes on beneath. Um, um, and uh, it's been, it's it's really great to share this knowledge and, and thank you for letting us in, giving us a, a peek into the kind of research that's going on at GSD. It's uh, amazing stuff and it's really wonderful to see. So, been a pleasure. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you so much. Thanks to the entire team. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.